It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I'll be your host this morning. We have an absolutely awesome show for you today. And... Uh, I encourage you to be with us for the entire two-hour period. We're going to uh, address four separate topics today. One, uh, in our first segment, Supreme Court and surveillance. There are two brand new uh, certificate or certs, as they call them, uh, certiorari uh, requests to the Supreme Court to hear cases regarding uh, warrantless wire phone, uh, cell phone wireless taps. And uh, the second issue is going to be a very, very exciting discussion about uh, what's called Wi-Fi mesh networks. Now, these are networks that are enable you to will enable us to um, basically bypass the internet with with still having access to it, but bypassing all of the uh, limitations on it, including how to get access to the internet in a shared way that doesn't cost anyone anything. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Make sure you're with us for the second segment uh, this morning. Our third will be uh, Greenwald and his partner's search that occurred the other day at the um, airport in uh, Heathrow. And um, they confiscated a bunch of his, uh, of his digital equipment and, and electronics. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how that expresses and shows what's really going on in the uh, the world of governments repressing free speech. <clears throat> and then fourth, and finally, we're going to talk again about free speech, but with on a different aspect, and how government is pressuring uh, companies that offer services, uh, such as uh, Silent Circle and uh, the company that was used actually by Snowden, to shut them down so that you don't have access to those services. And so um, I think these are some important topics. We're going to cover them in, in depth this morning. And uh, I'm glad that you're you're with us and joining us. Let's jump right into it, shall we? Uh, by the way, you can find all of these stories posted on our, on our Facebook page and our website. You can go to our website at americasvoicenow.org. You can find our, our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. And then you can find this and every other program that we do on our YouTube uh, channel at youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. Now, the goal, of course, on the YouTube side is that uh, if any of these uh, four segments this morning uh, hit, a, hit a, uh, a button for you, then what I'd ask that you do is please share that with some friends or some folks that are sitting on the fence uh, that might be uh, won over to our side and our way of thinking. Our goal, of course, is to educate, to inform, to motivate, and activate. And so by educating, we bring folks to awareness. Uh, by informing ourselves and those in our circle of influence, we make an impact. And then we motivate ourselves and others around us to take action and to restore and preserve the uh, constitutional government, which we actually um, have long ago lost. So, okay, let's jump right into this. The Obama administration has asked that the Supreme Court allow warrantless wire uh, cell phone searches. Now, I hate to say it, and I hate to inform the DOJ and the Obama administration, but you're a little late. Uh, my concern with this is pretty obvious. At this stage in the game, they've been doing this for quite some time, and this is the old adage of it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Now, my, my biggest concern, of course, with that, and yours should be as well, is that this kind of a policy of it's easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission should never apply to governments. I mean, that, that kind of an excuse is reserved to your four-year-old who snitches a cookie out of the jar. But it never should be applied towards governments violating and stomping all over their citizens' opportunity for uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, free speech, the, the freedom and liberty. I mean, that's inexcusable on its face and downright criminal. And so 
the problem of of uh, where we stand with this is that the Supreme Court is likely to hear these cases, or at least one of them. There's two actually out there. We're going to go over them in a moment. But here's the problem. Uh, they're going to hear these cases, or at least one of them. And here's the problem. They're going to find in favor of the government. And the reason why they are is because we're being assured now of what our founders had warned us about. And that is that the Supreme Court is a body and an arm of the federal government and therefore owes its fiduciary responsibility. And if you don't know what that word fiduciary means, I want you to take a moment to look it up. That's an important word and you need to understand it. It's usually applied in financial situations. But a fiduciary is someone who owes their obligation and their loyalty to you. In other words, someone you've given a power of attorney over your bank account, as an example, right? But in this case, the Supreme Court owes their fiduciary responsibility to the government. And they do because the government is who pays for them, who has appointed them. And for all intents and purposes, without any kind of term limitations, Supreme Court justices sit in rule in favor of whatever administrative ideology put them into play in the first place. And so... Our founders warned us about this and, and have given us plenty of documentation and supporting information that tells us that the Supreme Court was never considered or purposed or intended to act as a final arbiter of differences of constitutionality. Now, the real original purpose of the Supreme Court was to settle arguments among states. In other words, is this state adjacent to me doing something that injures my state, and also to, to isolate and, and to um, resolve issues and dilemmas between a citizen and state government or a citizen and federal government. But they were never intended to create law via activism. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we are today. What we have today is a, a, a Supreme Court that acts as a, uh, a sanctioning body for unconstitutional or extra constitutional law. And that is the problem. Anytime you have a body that can say, we rubber stamp government's tyranny, they are no longer representing their true intended purpose. And that is how the Supreme Court is currently used today. There are literally hundreds of examples of it that can easily be found in very, very me recent and modern history. And when we talk about things like the Obamacare debacle where it's a tax, but it's not really a tax, but the, the, the Supreme Court calls it a tax, even though the government didn't advance that position because they knew they would lose on that. Then the Supreme Court turns around and says, well, we're going to call it a tax and make it acceptable. You see how this kind of thing happens when you've had cases where the uh, individuals have sued or, or filed suit against the federal government for issues like um, uh, the the surveillance that's going on and things like that. And the Supreme Court rules that the Fourth Amendment can be overridden by all kinds or all manner of nonsense, including, as an example, the, the example I gave you yesterday and a couple of days ago, where you've got Texas police officers who pull women over on the side of the road, call a woman police officer over, and because they allegedly smell marijuana, literally have those women raped digitally with the, the, with the female officer's fingers, in body cavity searches. Now, I, I tell you what, that's so far inexcusable. That is so far outside the boundaries of what the United States of America is about that no court that is operating in a legitimate fashion can condone that. I mean, it's impossible to conceive that any court would condone a law enforcement officer based on the premise that another officer may have smelled marijuana, which is purely subjective, of course, there's no proof, and then have the right to rape. And I do mean rape because that's exactly what that is. It is a forced penetration. And I'm sorry if I'm going to get, get squeamish people upset here. That is a forced penetration of a woman's uh, private area. And, I, and it wasn't just in the front. It was front and back. Now, I got to tell you, there is no excuse on the face of the planet that warrants that. And any court that would tell you that there is, is a court that is operating in tyranny. Period. End of argument. End of discussion. There's nothing further to review. If you can tell me that based on an officer's subjective claim 
that he may have smelled marijuana, that they have the right to bring in a female officer as if that's some kind of blanket amnesty because it's not a male? you got to be flipping kidding me. So what we have is a, a Supreme Court that sanctions tyranny by the government. And when you have that, and in fact, I wrote it, the, the, the Supreme Court will likely hear this case and will likely find in favor of the government. Just another assurance that our founders were correct when they told us that the Supreme Court is not the final arbiter of our Constitution. That's because they are a part of the government itself and therefore owe their allegiance to their master and benefactor. That they can never be objective in their rulings leads to tyranny upon tyranny, all sanctioned by the court itself. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where we are. I posted two articles that are linked to this, and I want you to read them both. Here's the argument. Can the police arrest you, or I'm sorry, if they arrest you, do they have a warrant to rifle through your cell phone? Now, numerous courts have been split on the decision, and we're going to keep referring back and forth to the courts because courts are supposed to protect us, the citizens, from tyranny in government. However, when they do that, what happens is government just raises, it, raises the bar and takes it to the next higher level. And in fact, at some point, it finally gets its way and wins its way to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court can hit, be hit by both federal cases and state cases, which have reached the state Supreme Court, but still the, the, uh, the plaintiff or the defendant is not satisfied. And then they can bring it before the Supreme Court on the federal side if they feel that this is something that would warrant uh, and if the Supreme Court agrees, that this is something that would warrant a, um, a an educational or not an educational, but a, a, a founding principle that can be applied across the nation. Or if the dispute is so uh, so ingrained in, and, the, and the two sides are so diametrically opposed on the Supreme on the uh, state side and the, and the plaintiff side, that the Supreme Court has to step in and, and solve that that uh, case, if you will, the controversy. And that's how they refer to it in the court. There has to be a true controversy, right? So in this case, they warrant they, they this is a this is an appeal from a 2007 arrest. And last week, the Obama administration, through the Department of Justice, asked the Supreme Court to resolve the issue and rule that the Fourth Amendment allows warrantless cell phone searching. Now, this is the this is not listening to your phone calls. This is not metadata. This is not anything to do with the NSA and scanning. But all of this is interrelated because it's all integral and tied together. In other words, integral um, w would, would be, the, the word integral means that the, the, the components to, to bake a cake are integral to each other. You've got to have eggs. You've got to have flour. You've got to have sugar. You've got to have whatever. You get the idea. <clears throat> in 07, the police arrested this guy in Massachusetts. He appeared to be selling crack from his car. They seized his cell phone and noticed that he was receiving calls from a, 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 a uh, uh, savings in or a thing in there called my house, right? This was a, a entry in a cell phone. So they went over and they they determined the number for my house. They get they got they went and pulled the records. Where well, where does that phone reside? They went over to the house. They searched it. They found drugs, cash, and guns. The defendant was convicted, but on appeal, he argued that accessing the information on his cell phone without a warrant violated his Fourth Amendment right. This year, a First Circuit Court of Appeals. So let's understand, and I'm going to, uh, let me just explain to you uh, in a moment what that, how that, how the appeal system works. They accepted the man's argument, ruling that the police should have gotten a warrant before accessing the information on the guy's phone. All right. So you understand how this works. And, and, and I think it's important that every American should truly understand our justice system or injustice system, because most people don't re realize how court systems operate. And, and they operate on multiple tiers or of, of hierarchy. So when you are uh, found guilty in a local court, let's say of a traffic violation, you can appeal that to the next level of court, right, which is typically called an appellate court. In the state, you have multiple levels of, of appeal until you reach the state Supreme Court, which is similar to the federal Supreme Court, except it only handles cases within that state. So if you live in the state of Indiana, I mean, in, in Indiana, if you live in the state of Illinois or you live in the state of, uh, of, of Missouri or you live in the state of Texas, you can file a case in your own state courts that goes through the appellate court process and goes from one court to the second appellate court and then usually hits the Supreme Court. There's usually only three layers there or so. 
Sometimes you'll have a city court that goes to a county court that goes to a state appellate court that goes to a state Supreme Court. Each state's different. In the federal system, you have three layers. The first is called the district court. And when you are convicted in a district court, you can then appeal to that to that um, uh, circuit court. And the circuit court um, has a, a, a court of appeals. There's 12 circuits in the federal system. And so you can go, if, it depends on where you live and where those circuits reside. So if you're in Missouri where I am, you're in the 8th circuit. Uh, Michigan would, and, and, and uh, Chicago would be in the 6th circuit as an example. So if you lose in your district court, or if they lose in the district court, they appeal to the the appellate court, which would be, in this case, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, or the First Circuit, or the Third, or the Tenth, or the Ninth, or whatever. That court of appeals then hears the case, and there's a three-judge panel that hears the case. Now, appeals courts don't hear it like a regular case, and there's not a whole trial. They only hear a very, very specific and narrow argument about one specific issue. So, as an example, you might lose in the district court, like this guy did. And then he appeals to the appellate court and he says, well, I was found guilty, but I was found guilty because they did something illegal in my case, which was to violate my Fourth Amendment rights. And so if you find that if the appellate court finds and the three judge panel find that you did, in fact, um, inappropriately find me guilty, then the entire case gets either wiped out or it gets remanded back to the lower court with a ruling from the appellate court that says you now have to hear this case again. But you have to take all of that evidence that you gathered out of the mix and reapply the case, rehear the case, give the guy a new trial. And then if you still find him guilty, then you can go ahead. All right. If the appellate court case is lost by either the government or the defendant, then you can appeal to the Supreme Court. And each of these courts gets uh, singularly harder to, to reach. In other words, they, they, they review the controversy in the case more closer and closer and closer each level you go up and the supreme court nor the appellate court uh, neither of those courts have to take a case the the uh, it's almost invariable that, that that an appeals court will hear a case but the supreme court hears very very few and they will only take a case if they feel that it has one national significance that will apply across the board or if it resolves a split in multiple uh, circuits. So if the Fifth Circuit says this, but the Seventh Circuit says that, and the Ninth Circuit says something completely, again, different, then the Supreme Court will say, we're going to rule on it so that we have a uniform ruling across all circuits. And that's the way it works. Now, in this case, they're hearing this because the guy lost at the district level. He went to the appeals court. Boy, I can see I'm running out of time. I got five minutes left in this segment. We may have to extend this to the next segment because this is important. It went on to the next appellate level, which is the the, the first uh, circuit court of appeals in wherever he is. And they the court said, you know what, you're right. This wasn't a legal search. They didn't have a right to go through your cell phone. And the defendant, uh, so anyway, they ruled on that and the, that the police should have gotten a warrant before they accessed the information and searched through the guy's phone. The Obama administration disagrees. And here's what here's what happens. They filed a petition earlier this month asking the Supreme Court to hear the case. Their argument is that the First Circuit's ruling conflicts with the rulings of several other appeals courts. Here's where I talked about before where circuits are split. That's what they call that, right? You got split circuit decisions. As well as with earlier Supreme Court cases. Those earlier cases have given the police broad discretion to search possessions on the person of an arrested sub suspect, including notebooks, calendars, and pagers. The government contends that a cell phone is no different than any other object a suspect may be carrying. But as the storage capacity of cell phones rises, that position could become harder to defend. Our smartphones increasingly can contain everything about our digital lives. I'm reading straight from the article in Washington Post now. Our smartphones increasingly contain everything about our digital lives, including email, text messages, photographs, and browser histories of where you've you know, been on the Internet, and much more. It would be troubling if the police had the power to get all that information with no warrant merely by arresting a suspect. 
We're going to get into why in a moment. On the other hand, there, the Massachusetts case involves a primitive flip phone. Don't forget, this is back in 07, right? So the smartphone hadn't really made a big hit yet. This, this could make it a bad test case, and here's why the Supreme Court's going to take this. I'm going to get to that in a moment. The specific phone involved in this 07 incident likely did not have the wealth of information that we store on modern cell phones. It's arguably more analogous to the address books and pagers that courts have already said that the police can search. So Oren Kerr, he points it out in an article that, uh, that they reference here. If the Supreme Court rules on the case, it will be making a decision based on facts that are now atypical, in other words, not common, and are, are getting more outdated every passing month. All right, so let's analyze this for a moment. Let's you put on our critical thinking caps. Everybody put on a hat. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to review why this matters and how it matters to you. And then we're going to look at a second case that's also before the Supreme Court as well. First of all, the fact that they can search through a phone itself is extra constitutional in its nature. The Fourth Amendment requires that they that you be that they be blocked from unreasonable search and seizure of your effects and a cell phone is certainly an effect by the way so is your email your text messaging your photographs your browser history as well as your notebooks your address books and pagers so the court has already approved of the unconstitutionality of those searches and now they're going to look at this and here's what they're going to do the Supreme Court is likely to take this case for a couple of reasons. One, this is a political hot potato, and they want to address it. And so they're going to take this case because it gives them an opportunity to make a ruling that can be built upon. In other words, they want to stand on the shoulders of previous rulings when this case comes, when cases like this come before them again. And they're going to find against the defendant, and they're going to say that it was a legitimate search. And the reason they're going to do that is because it builds credibility for the next case because courts work on a system called precedent. And it's very important that we understand precedent and how it is twisted and misused in our judicial system today. Now, we're down to one minute and 18 seconds. And I wanted to talk about this mesh network thing, but I think I'm going to hold that for tomorrow. And I'll tell you why. I want to make sure that we're fully understanding of the implications of this. So we're going to do a part two in our second segment you're going to stick with us for that because this is a very, very important aspect of our judicial system that you should fully understand. And I say that because at some point in time in your life, and especially the way things are descending and degrading right now in our system of justice and our system of legitimate government, you will at some point in time find yourself in front of courts. And you're going to need to understand how they operate without having to go and pay a lawyer who's going to misinform you because he is actually an officer of the court. He is not truly representing you. So stick with me for a moment. We're going to take a break. When we do, we'll come back and we're going to tap into more about this and understand why the courts are going to accept this and how it's going to shake out in your worst interest. All right? Um, you're listening to America's Voice now. Please ride with us for the rest of the morning. We've got uh, three more segments to go. The second one is going to tear this thing apart and get down into the nitty-gritty of it. We're going to get down into the roots of it and understand it thoroughly. You can find us at americasvoicenow.org. We'll be right back. 